podcast. My name is Steve Sanders. Uh, I am an alumnus of Mayor Brown in Chicago and of the Chicago Lawyer Chapter of the American Constitution Society. And I'm here to welcome you to the 17th um, Collaborative Supreme Court Term and Review and Panel Discussion sponsored by the American Constitution Society Chicago Lawyer Chapter and the ACLU of Illinois. We unfortunately skipped last year because of the pandemic. We are here virtually all together this year. Um, we hope that we will be back in person at our host, Mayor Brown, for next year's panel. But in the meantime, um, we have a, a one-hour discussion planned for you. Our goal is to wrap things up by about one o'clock or so. Um, and, and our format will be as follows. There, are, there, there will be five presentations. Each of these presenters, leading lawyers and scholars, will take about five minutes to talk about one particular case that we think will be of particular interest to this audience. After that, we'll have some general discussion among the panelists to get their thoughts about the current court term and what might be ahead. And we will also leave time for your questions. And so if you'd like to submit a question, uh, please questions, not statements, but questions to the panelists about their remarks or about the Supreme Court's term, please use the chat function in the Zoom webinar. A um, couple of other housekeeping things. If you need closed captioning, that is available. You can uh, hit the closed caption button at the uh, bottom of your screen, at the bottom of the Zoom window. And also one hour of Illinois CLE, uh, continuing legal education credit, has been approved for this program. At the end of the program, near the one o'clock uh, central time mark, um, we will provide you with the email address where you will send your name and your Illinois bar number, and then you will be uh, uh, the the ACL uh, the uh, ACS uh, chapter uh, will graciously take care of signing you up for your one hour of CLE credit. So um, I think that takes care of the introductions. Again, welcome. Thanks for joining us. I'm going to go ahead and quickly introduce our panelists in the order in which uh, they're going to speak. Um, uh, uh, let's see, oops. Um, sorry about that, something just happened on my screen. Um, uh, first up will be Ami Gandhi. Ami is the senior counsel of the Chicago Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights in Chicago. Um, it's also significant that Next week at the ACS Chicago Lawyer Chapter's annual Legal Legends Luncheon, Ami will be honored for her contributions to advance the status of Chicago area women and the goals of the American Constitution Society with the ACS's Ruth Goldberg Award. And so congratulations to Ami. Uh, we would love all of you to join us. It will be a virtual event. Um, a registration link will be provided in chat or you can search for ACS Chicago Lawyer Chapter events to be part of the uh, Legal Legends Luncheon on July 21st. Um, so Ami will lead us off. Uh, next, um, Nusrath Chowdhury, who is the uh, uh, Roger Paschal Legal Director of the ACLU of Illinois. Um, uh, uh, after Nusrath, Josh Yount, who is a partner at the, in the Chicago office of Mayor Brown. Mayor Brown has long been uh, a, a partner, sponsor, collaborator for us with this event and a supporter of the ACS chapter. We very much appreciate that. Um, next will be Aziz Huck, who is back joining us after uh, having been a part of this panel several years ago. Aziz is the Frank and Bernice J. Greenberg Professor of Law at the University of Chicago. And then finally, Steve Schwinn, a veteran participant of this panel. Uh, Steve is a professor of law at the, University of, uh, at the University of Illinois Chicago Law School. Um, so unless I have forgotten something, I think we're ready to begin the panel presentations. Uh, and so I will ask uh, Ami to get us started uh, telling us about what the Supreme Court has done and how worried we should be about um, the court's decision interpreting the Voting Rights Act case. So Ami. Thank you so much. Thanks for the chance to be here this afternoon. I'm Ami Gandhi, Senior Counsel at Chicago Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights, where I lead our organization's voting rights work in Illinois and Indiana. We work to reduce barriers to voting and improve civic participation, especially in communities of color and low-income communities. We help voters in person and over the phone every election, 
And we especially focus on troubleshooting in communities most directly affected by disenfranchisement, including black voters, new citizens and others facing barriers to the polls. Advocates like us and voters more broadly are still reeling from the Brnovich versus Democratic National Committee decision issued about two weeks ago in a six to three ruling along partisan lines that dealt a major blow to the landmark 1965 Federal Voting Rights Act. The decision has major consequences for our ability to challenge discriminatory voting laws during a time when states across the country are using unfounded fears of voter fraud to propose and pass anti-voter legislation. Brnovich started as a 2016 lawsuit brought by the DNC against Arizona's Attorney General and Secretary of State, which challenged two state laws based on racial discrimination. The first state law that was challenged requires ballots that are cast in the wrong precinct to be thrown out, even for votes for president, governor, or some other race in which the voter could have cast a ballot anywhere in the state. The second law criminalizes anyone who returns a mail-in ballot for another voter, unless that person is a family member or caregiver. Both these state laws have been shown to disproportionately affect Black, Latino, and Indigenous voters. For example, the ballot collection law especially harms Indigenous voters living on rural reservations who have long relied on third-party ballot collection because of sparsely located post offices and low rates of vehicle ownership. Changing gears to the other law that was challenged, the out of precinct law, this also has a disproportionate racial impact because for example, black and Latino voters are significantly more likely to have their polling places changed in Arizona, which is often why someone would even end up in the situation where they are voting at the wrong polling place. Under section two of the Voting Rights Act, any voting practice that results in the denial or abridgment of the right to vote based on race is prohibited. But the justices disagreed on the rules to, pr to prove a violation of section two. Writing for the majority, Justice Alito wrote that courts must look to the totality of the circumstances to establish whether the laws violate section two and that it's not enough to prove disparate impact or discriminatory effect. Justice Alito came up with a new set of five rules, including whether the state provides multiple ways to vote and whether there is a strong state interest in the regulation. The majority found preventing election fraud to be a strong and legitimate state interest and the dissenting minority did not. Under the majority's, underlying the majority's opinion is the reasoning that quote, Arizona law generally makes it very easy to vote. This legal reasoning tactic of zooming out to such a degree ignores the reality of what disenfranchised voters face, which is totally different than what the general system theoretically provides. An unrelated positive sounding feature of an election system unfortunately does not provide any comfort to someone who has unfairly been excluded from having their vote be counted. Writing for the dissent, Justice Kagan pointed out that one of the most effective forms of voter suppression is basically like death by a thousand paper cuts where small obstacles and inconveniences to voters are stacked on top of each other until they become major barriers. The dissent called the Voting Rights Act the single statute that is the best of America and reminds us of the worst of America because unfortunately, even in the year 2021, it's still needed. The case drastically lifted the bar that we have to overcome to bring successful claims under Section 2, though it still importantly leaves the door open to challenges such as redistricting challenges and vote, voter dilution claims. We should take a lesson away from this, that reliance on litigation and the courts is not always the best option. Grassroots and community-led mobilization efforts to get more folks access to the ballot are now more important than ever because Brnovich signals that federal courts are unlikely to step in after the fact and remedy any discriminatory disparities. Brnovich also signals that we are past overdue for new federal voting rights legislation that will protect voter access and close racial gaps across the country, 
which is why advocates are fighting hard for bills like For the People Act, also called HR1 or S1. Thank you so much. Let me thank you. Um, uh, Nusroth, I, uh, one thing I neglected to mention at the top is I now have the privilege of teaching at Indiana University in Bloomington, and one of my favorite courses is teaching first-year constitutional law, and I really enjoy telling the students the backstories behind, you know, the, the interesting little human interest backstories uh, behind these cases that get to the Supreme Court. So you're going to tell us about a case that the uh, ACLU uh, actually litigated and, and won in this case involving a high school cheerleader, and I believe it was her Snapchat account. So please tell us about that. Exactly. This is a case for the digital age and for modern uh, speech rights and student rights in general. This is Mahoney Area School District versus BL and the ACLU of Illinois, along with others, represented Brandy Levy, a 14-year-old cheerleader who, in her disappointment uh, in not making the varsity cheerleading team, sent two Snapchat messages, uh, which are it's from a smartphone application that she had uh, on a weekend while with a friend from a local convenience store. And those two messages included a, a photo with her and her friend with their middle fingers up um, and a lot of F-bombs uh, criticizing her school, the cheerleading squad and softball because she didn't make the softball and varsity cheerleading uh, teams. What ended up happening was another student took a photo of her Snapchat and shared it with coaches and teachers, and she was ultimately disciplined with one year of suspension from the cheerleading squad as a result. And she felt her First Amendment rights were violated and her parents agreed, and they filed a First Amendment lawsuit uh, challenging that decision. And very interestingly, and in contrast to the decision that we just heard Ami talk about, this was an eight to one ruling uh, protecting First Amendment rights uh, with only Justice Thomas dissenting. So you don't see a partisan split here in the court. By contrast, you see a really broad consensus over what is in some ways a narrow but really important ruling. And that is that when students leave campus, they don't carry with them all of the restrictions that come with student speech on campus. And essentially, a lot of this doctrine was first articulated in a, a decision called Tinker versus Des Moines Independent School District from 1969, when students went to school with black armbands protesting the Vietnam War. And the Supreme Court made clear that students have free speech rights, but that the school can regulate that speech if it causes material and substantial disruption to the school or to discipline. And the question here was, does that ability to regulate apply to off-campus speech? And instead of enunciating really specific parameters when uh, the school can regulate off-campus speech, instead, you know, eight justices joined together to say that there are three broad characteristics of off-campus speech that really diminish the school's interest in regulating that speech. And those three are as follows. The first is that when students are on campus and in school, generally the school is taking the role of parents and guardians in regulating what students do in terms of good manners and, and other issues. And that really doesn't apply to fully off-campus speech. The second is that public schools actually have an interest in fostering unpopular speech. Part of what public schools do is teach the principles of democracy, and that includes the common saying that I might not agree with what you say, but I am going to vigorously defend your right to be able to say that. And then finally, if student speech off campus was regulated the same way as student speech on campus, students would essentially be under 24 hour regulation by schools for what they say. And that inability of students to actually practice free speech is detrimental to their rights. So with those three categories and applying the principles to this case, the Supreme Court held that there was no disruption of school activities or even extracurricular activities. And the school's interest in teaching good manners and addressing morale just weren't substantiated by the record. So there was no, uh, there was no school interest here that was hurt. And instead, there was a real clear First Amendment violation. This decision is integral in an age where, as we know, due to the pandemic, that those lines between on-campus and off-campus speech are blurred. And here we see a real consensus in an opinion by Justice Breyer. 
you know, holding that students do have rights and we should celebrate this in an era where students are speaking out uh, often on different sides of issues. Some students are pro-gun rights, some students are opposed to gun rights. Students are seeking to protest uh, military operations and they're seeking to support Black Lives Matter. Those are the kinds of opinions we want students to be able to express. And this case makes clear that simply because a student is engaging in that speech, the kind of regulations that come with uh, campus-based speech don't automatically apply off campus. Great, thank you so much. Um, uh, next we have uh, Josh Yacht, and we're really uh, privileged to have Josh uh, talk to us today about an important decision um, regarding class actions and specifically limiting the circumstances under which class actions can be brought because Josh, as a partner at Mayor Brown, uh, really is a, a, a leading authority and, and a highly experienced litigator when it comes to class action issues. So Josh, uh, TransUnion versus Ramirez, another one of those decisions that came down near the end of the court's term this year. Uh, thank you, Steve. Uh, yeah, I, I should say at the outset, you know, my, the views I uh, express here are uh, my own views, not the views of Mayor Brown or, or Mayor Brown's clients. Uh, so TransUnion addresses what counts as an injury that it gives a private plaintiff standing to bring a lawsuit in federal court. Uh, the Supreme Court considered two class action claims brought under the Federal Fair Credit Reporting Act. Uh, the first claim uh, alleged that TransUnion, a credit reporting agency, did not use reasonable procedures in ensuring the accuracy of alerts that indicated that an individual uh, was a potential match to a name on uh, a list of serious criminals that the Treasury Department maintains. Uh, the second claim uh, alleged that TransUnion did not comply with form and content requirements imposed by the, the FCRA. Uh, the case arose out of uh, Sergio Ramirez's experience when he went to um, buy a car and had difficulty obtaining a loan uh, because a TransUnion report had uh, flagged him as a potential match uh, and as a result, uh, Mr. Ramirez uh, had canceled a vacation and experienced some embarrassment. Uh, the, the crux of the case arose out of the fact that unlike Mr. Ramirez, there, there was no evidence of harm to any of the other uh, class members. Uh, and indeed only about 1,850 of the 8,200 class members even had their um, um, alerts sent to a third party. Um, for the rest, it never made it outside of uh, TransUnion. Uh, the case went to a jury. A jury found for the class, awarded damages. The Ninth Circuit affirmed. Um, the Supreme Court uh, reversed on Article III standing grounds. With respect to the reasonable procedures claim, uh, the court said that the 6,300 class members who uh, didn't have their reports disseminated uh, had no concrete injury. Um, without publication of the reports, there's no reputational harm and the risk of future harm never materialized and wasn't in, in the court's view imminent or substantial in any of it. As for the form and content claim, uh, the court ruled that no one besides Mr. Ramirez had standing because there was no evidence in the record that any of them read the uh, mailings that uh, TransUnion sent to them, much less had any adverse consequences from the um, violations, of, alleged violations of the form and content rules. In reaching those conclusions, the Supreme Court made five key rulings. Uh, the first was that Congress cannot enact an injury into existence. Uh, courts have to make an independent determination of whether a claimed harm is the kind of harm that traditionally has been able to allow a lawsuit in American courts. 
um, by looking to whether it has an injury that has a close relationship to a traditional kind of injury, like an injury to a person, an injury to property, an injury to, injury to reputation, injury to uh, constitutional rights, uh, those, those sorts of injuries. Uh, second key ruling is that every class member has to have Article III uh, standing. Um, that's important because it should uh, allow courts to uh, deny class certification when a, uh, or at least with respect to uh, classes that have large numbers or even small numbers of uh, uninjured individuals in the proposed class. Um, third, in a damages lawsuit, uh, a mere risk of future injury does not confer standing. Uh, it's possible that the risk might produce a separate independent injury like psychological harm or maybe some costs to mitigate the risk, but the risk itself does not create an injury, at least in the damages action. But even for injunctive actions, uh, a risk of future harm cannot be an Article III injury unless it is both substantial and imminent. Uh, so some speculative risk is not gonna cut it. Uh, and finally, uh, an informational injury that has no adverse effects is not an Article III injury. So those are the five key rulings. The one thing I would say to keep in mind about TransUnion and its standing rulings is that the standing rulings really don't necessarily have political valence. They, uh, they can be used to protect liberal progressive policies just as they can be used to protect conservative policies. And I think you can see that uh, from the Obamacare case that was decided this term as well, which uh, the Supreme Court uh, ruled, uh, upheld, well, I shouldn't say upheld, it rejected the challenge to Obamacare on standing grounds, finding that the plaintiffs in that case had not proven that they were harmed in any way by the provision of, uh, of Obamacare that was being challenged. Um, it's another, you know, and, you know, even more, um, you know, maybe important for the future. I saw in the New York Times that Texas has enacted a um, unusual uh, abortion law that has essentially deputized anyone uh, in Texas, maybe anyone in the world, to uh, sue abortion providers uh, and recover statutory damages. Uh, but that would seem to be the kind of law that the uh, Supreme Court has just said in TransUnion um, that plaintiffs lacking any real injury, any concrete injury, um, cannot uh, enforce. Okay, uh, Josh, thanks for that, that additional perspective and the sort of real world impact. And thanks for mentioning the Obamacare decision normally uh, that you know, some of you in the audience may have been wondering, when is that coming up? And it's something that we would have been focusing on. Certainly a, a lot of people speculated when uh, Justice, uh, now Justice Amy Coney Barrett was nominated that you know, her vote was going to assure that Obamacare went down. And as Josh described, um, that case went out with sort of a whimper. Uh, the court determined that the plaintiffs bringing it didn't have standing, so it didn't reach the merits. And, and both that, that case and TransUnion are an illustration, again, for those of us who teach and follow con law of just how pivotal the concept of Article III standing, who has an injury and who actually doesn't, who gets to challenge a law and who doesn't, um, how pivotal that can be. So Josh, thank you. Um, Aziz, the, um, uh, for, for quite a while now, um, there has been a sort of ongoing tug of war between um, LGBTQ equality and claims of religious liberty. We saw this in the Masterpiece Cake Shop case. We, we heard echoes of it in previous decisions the court made related to same-sex marriage, warnings that uh, this was going to be a problem. This term, again, near the end of the term, a case came down that gives us at least some insight into the court's current approach. Um, to those clashes, and particularly when religious organizations are impacted by 
um, uh, by laws intended to protect gay rights. So tell us about the Fulton case. Thanks, Steve. Um, Fulton versus the city of Pencil uh, Philadelphia uh, is a case that arises out of Philadelphia's foster care system. Philadelphia contracts with private entities to place children who enter uh, into foster care. One of the entities that Philadelphia contracts with is a Catholic charity called Catholic Social Services. CSS refuses to place uh, foster children either with unmarried couples or pertinent here, uh, same-sex couples, even if they're married. Philadelphia decided to uh, end CSS's contract with the city uh, uh, with respect to foster care placement because of this discrimination against same-sex couples. The Catholic charity sued, invoking the First Amendment, um, and the case went uh, up through the Third Circuit to the US Supreme Court. Now, the Catholic charity uh, in Fulton won, and the Catholic charity's victory was unanimous. All nine justices voted for the uh, 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 for the conclusion that the city of Philadelphia had violated the First Amendment rights of the Catholic charity. Uh, but what's important about Fulton is that the lawyers for the Catholic charity had asked the court not just for a victory for their client, but for a change in the governing rule of First Amendment free exercise law. The court split 6-3 with respect to that request. Six justices adopted what I think at first blush seems a narrower ruling, holding that under the First Amendment precedent, uh, as it now stands, uh, a, a case called Smith v. Employment Decision, uh, the city of Philadelphia had discriminated against the uh, Catholic uh, social services unconstitutionally, Three justices, with uh, Justice Alito writing a 70-page magnum opus, would have rejected the uh, 1991 Smith ruling and installed in its place a, a, a different First Amendment rule. Now, what's at stake in the majority and the concurrence uh, rulings? Uh, let me start with what's at stake with respect to the uh, proposal uh, that Justice Alito, Gorsuch, and Thomas would have endorsed, and then let me work backward to the majority rule. So what uh, Justice Alito would have done was to uh, abandon the rule uh, established under uh, the Smith case in 1991 uh, and move to a rule that was much more hospitable to uh, religious liberty claims. Uh, the Smith rule uh, held that uh, religious liberty under the First Amendment was violated if and only if uh, the state did something that was discriminatory on its face. It, it enacted a rule that was not, uh, that was not facially neutral uh, 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 and that or that uh, uh, singled out with animus a religious group. Uh, Justice uh, Alito would have uh, replaced that rule uh, with a much broader rule that allowed religious liberty, uh, religious individuals or institutions uh, to invoke the First Amendment whenever their First Amendment liberties were burdened. Um, this matters uh, because religious uh, groups, uh, including uh, the Catholic charity at issue in Fulton, have increasingly deployed uh, First Amendment claims, not merely to protect enclaves of social and cultural life, which is the way that religious liberty claims were litigated in the 1960s and 1970s, but to assert the authority to change the terms of interaction in the public sphere, right? This is why we have religious liberty claims pertaining to contraception mandates. This is why we have religious liberty claims with respect to uh, interactions between religious and, and uh, individuals and same-sex couples. The, um, the, the, so the move away from Smith would be truly dramatic. However, the narrower rule adopted by the majority in uh, Fulton also has important consequences. The, ma the majority rule is that uh, religious liberty is violated if 
uh, the state uh, imposes a general prohibition that has a, a, a waiver in it and doesn't grant a waiver to a religious body that objects to the general rule. This, is, this has been construed as a, a, a narrow ruling in the press, uh, but um, I don't think it's anything of the kind. Many generally applicable laws contain waivers. And it is frequently the case that those waivers are not uh, uh, made available to religious entities. What we will see after Fulton is many instances of religious uh, organizations claiming that they have been discriminated against because of the failure to give them a waiver. Okay, uh, Aziz, thank you. Um, in, in those of you, and by the way, we are up to uh, 310 participants, or we were a minute ago, now we're at 309. So this is terrific. Thanks all of you for joining us. The ACLU and ACS are delighted that there's this much interest in, in this annual program. Um, in the past, we have always called this a Supreme Court term and review program, but we thought this year, it's also important to look ahead a bit um, to cases that uh, a progressive legal audience like this one would be interested in. The Supreme Court has docketed uh, what could be a major Second Amendment gun rights case related to concealed carry. Concealed carry. It, had also, it has also granted cert uh, in a case related to abortion that is commonly thought to pose a threat potentially to um, Planned Parenthood versus Casey, maybe even Roe versus Wade. So Steve Schwinn from the University of Illinois, you've been following this case. Um, tell us what you expect in this case, what you're looking for uh, as the court prepares to read briefs and hear arguments in this case in the next term next fall. <laughs> I knew I would do that. I forgot to unmute myself. Steve, thank you very much. And thanks for, uh, for facilitating this panel again this year. It's a, it's a real thrill and honor to be with you and our co-panelists. And wow, over 300 participants, isn't that fantastic? So thanks to all the organizers. Um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about the Dobbs case, the abortion case that's on the court's docket for next term. Before I talk about Dobbs itself, I'll just remind you that the court ruled in Roe versus Wade that there is a fundamental right to abortion. And then in Casey in 1992, modified that a little bit and said the, the turning point here is the point of viability of the fetus. Uh, state legislature or Congress can regulate abortion pre-viability so long as the regulation doesn't impose an undue burden on the right to an abortion. Post-viability, the government can go so far as banning abortion entirely so long as it provides for an exception for the life or health of, um, of the woman. Well, with Justice Amy Coney Barrett taking Justice Ginsburg's seat on the court, a number of us were concerned about the court taking on Roe versus Wade, and in fact, going so far as overturning Roe versus Wade. The number of state legislatures have been enacting laws around the country, teeing up a question for the court to take on Roe versus Wade. And the court has been, well, you can, I think it's safe to say, kind of dragging its feet in determining whether it really wants to address Roe versus Wade squarely. And so it had this Dobbs case out of Mississippi on its docket for, uh, for eight months or so, and finally agreed to, to hear it. The way the case came to the court is really interesting. I'll tell you a little bit about the facts and what the legal issues are involved and then what we might expect from the court and how that could affect things going forward. So this deals with a 2018 Mississippi law that bans abortion after 15 weeks of pregnancy, except in extreme health cases for the woman and certain cases involving the fetus. Now the 15 week ban is important here because the point of viability is generally around the 23rd or 24th week of the pregnancy. And so a ban after 15 weeks means that there's a period, that period between 15 weeks and 23 weeks where the state disallows abortion pre-viability and that disallowance, the challengers say, is an undue burden on a woman's right to an abortion, indeed more than an undue burden, right? It's a flat ban for that period. 
Now, Mississippi has come back and said, well, that's not really a flat ban. It's just a regulation on the pre-viability period of abortion. And in order to see Mississippi's point, what Mississippi says is, look, a woman can get an abortion up to the 15th week of pregnancy in that pre-viability period. It's just after the 15 weeks that, that we're banning abortion. And so that's more in the nature of a regulation. Mississippi says that it's doing this in the interest of the woman's health and in the interest of recognizing fetal development um, with current science. And what Mississippi says is fetuses can detect pain, that they've achieved a particular level of development at the 15 week period that we as a state need to respect. And then the state also says that it's concerned about the integrity of medical profession and the sanctity of life. What Mississippi did was uh, it lost in the lower courts under Roe and under Casey, and that was a pretty clear application of the Casey rule in the lower courts. So Mississippi took the case to the Supreme Court and in its cert petition, asked the court to look at this concept of viability. Mississippi argued that the concept of viability is kind of a squishy standard. It doesn't make a lot of sense and it's a kind of moving target. The court really ought to reassess that. Then Mississippi asked the court to take up a question. What's the rule here? Is it the Casey rule or is it the rule that the court has stated more recently in Hellerstadt and June Medical, the Texas and Louisiana cases? dealing with regulations about doctors who are performing abortions. Now, a number of folks say, well, they're, those, are, they're, those aren't different tests, they're the same test, but Mississippi was saying that needs some reconciliation. And then finally, Mississippi asked the court, and this goes back to a point that Steve and Josh were talking about with regard to standing, the Mississippi asked the court to reassess its third party standing rules that would allow and do allow under current law organizations like Jackson Medical to raise an abortion rights claim on behalf of its patients. The court, interestingly and importantly, certified a single question, and that is, are all pre-viability bans on abortion unconstitutional. Now, the way the court asks that question does potentially tee up Roe versus Wade and the fundamental right to an abortion. And so one possibility is that the court could overturn Roe versus Wade and write out of the Constitution a fundamental right to an abortion. Another possibility is that the court could, within the Roe and Casey framework, rule as Mississippi has claimed, according to Mississippi's theory of the case, that a ban between 15 weeks and 23 weeks isn't really a ban on abortion. It's not an undue burden on abortion because a woman, after all, according to Mississippi, could just get an abortion in week 14 and still comply with the law. Um, alternatively, it's conceivable, I think you know, highly unlikely that the court could, uh, could simply reject Mississippi's uh, law entirely under its existing Roe and Casey framework. Now, this case is likely to come out next June, uh, the ruling, which will be right in the middle of the 2022 midterm elections. And so this could have all kinds of interesting and important implications on the midterm elections and beyond in ordinary politics. We know how political Roe versus Wade is and how much it mobilizes our friends on the right. Well, a ruling overturning Roe versus Wade or severely limiting it, as I kind of expect in this case, uh, could mobilize our friends on the left and the politics of abortion could change entirely. So we'll see what happens next June and in the midterm elections, stay tuned. Great. Thank you, Steve. Um, we have about 20 minutes to go um, before we move into the next part of our program, so I don't forget to do this at the end. Let me give a quick shout out of thanks to uh, a number of people from the ACS Chicago Lawyer Chapter and the ACLU of Illinois who worked really hard behind the scenes to make this program possible to organize the technology, to be in contact with the panelists and do everything that's necessary to bring you a program like this. And so from the, AC, from the ACS Chicago Lawyer Chapter, let me thank Mac, uh, Max Eichenberger. And from the ACLU of Illinois, let me thank um, Jay Barth, Kayla Flanagan, Emily Scott, and Lisa Pereira. Uh, uh, they all worked very hard, again, to, to do all of the planning and organizing that makes a program like this seem like we just pulled it out of our hat, but we didn't. Uh, they were uh, they were tremendously they were tremendously hard. So thank you. Um, 
I had planned and I had told the panelists, you know, we're going to have some general discussion. I'm going to ask you a few questions about the direction of the court. But since we only have 20 minutes and we actually have some good audience questions that have come in, I'm, I'm hoping we can do that as part of the answers that you will offer to the audience. We were lucky to still have 310 people with us. Um, we like it that people are engaged. And so let me pick a few questions to direct um, to the panel or, or probably to individual panelists uh, and, and get your answers. And then if we run out of time, uh, you know, I've got my questions at the ready, but, but let me go ahead and give a little deference to the questions submitted by, uh, by the audience. Um, uh, Nusrath, I think this would be uh, to you. Um, there's a question, what if anything does uh, 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 Mahanoy uh, tell us about how, the, how lower courts might approach off-campus speech in the era of such widespread remote learning, for example, is a Zoom background that a student might have while they're participating in a class mm -hmm. uh, akin to an armband in Tinker, or is it something else? So how, uh, how can we translate what the court did in this case um, to the context of speech that might come up in the context of remote learning, like a Zoom class? Well, this is a great question, and it, it really speaks to the relevance of the decision to modern day applications. And the justices here in a decision written by Justice Breyer declined to delineate clear lines, but the opinion focuses a lot on the circumstances surrounding the speech at issue. So this was speech made by Brandy Levy on her personal cell phone, not a school issued laptop or school issued iPad. It was issued by her on a weekend not during school hours or in a place where she was engaged in school learning, but from a convenience store where she happened to hang out with a friend. And it was also a Snapchat message that went only to her Snapchat friends. And it was only through the conduct of other people, other individuals who took a snapshot of that Snapchat chat message on their phones and then disseminated it for, for it to circuitously get to the school. So what we can glean is that these sorts of facts really matter. And when you start changing some of those facts, that might matter. But eight justices did not want to delineate which of those facts were dispositive or whether the decision would have landed in a different way had some of those facts been different. So I think the question is a good one. And I think the Supreme Court deliberately did not answer that question of where is the line between fully off-campus speech and, and speech that really can, although uh, it initiates off-campus, have a material and substantial disruption, uh, disruptive effect in the school itself. Ms. Roth, do you think that this case is an example of something some commentators have said that the court often in some of the most controversial cases look for narrow paths? Uh, you have made clear this was a very fact-dependent case. It doesn't necessarily give us a lot of bright line rules for the future, right? Do you think that was by design or that's just the nature of an opinion written by Justice Breyer? So I, I have trouble really understanding what's in the <laughs> minds of justices, but I will say I do think this is an example of the justices wanting consensus. I think the clear message they sent is that you cannot regulate off-campus student speech the way you regulate on-campus student speech. And that is important, especially as students are engaging in digital speech activities off campus. Um, and I do think it's the it's a sign of the sort of minimalist approach that Justice Roberts has talked about that, you know, really courts should not resolve decisions they don't have to resolve. And here where the speech was so clearly off campus and did not have any disruption to the school itself, it didn't even um, really decline morale the way the school asserted it did or have the other unintended effects that there just wasn't even an evidentiary basis here for the school to regulate. And I think that's a strong message about the importance of First Amendment rights in the school context. Great, thank you. Um, and me, um, uh, 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 we are very much, those of us, you know, everyone who follows the news is very much aware that there are um, uh, uh, many efforts in, in the vast majority of states to change voting regulations, usually in the direction of making voting less available. And so someone asks, um, uh, you know, what would the Voting Rights Act decision mean going forward for the possibility of successfully challenging some variety of these voter suppression laws that are being passed? It, it seems as though um, the decision is a setback. But the theory, you know, can you imagine theories on which some of uh, some future cases might be brought against these laws that state legislatures are 
busily considering right now that, that might still be viable even in the wake of the Arizona decision? That's a great question. And while the decision is undoubtedly a setback, it's important to not lose hope. Let's remember that this is a redistricting year and cases brought challenging redistricting plans and vote dilution more generally were not addressed in this recent court decision and fully expect that advocates, communities of color and other interested stakeholders will file challenges based on those aspects of section two. Also keep in mind that intentionally discriminatory state laws still also were not the main focus of this recent court decision. In this day and age, we, we all well know that laws that have racist effects are not limited to situations where there was a very obvious outward display of racism that is captured in the evidence. Nonetheless, it, it will be an important tool to be able to challenge laws where there is proof of discriminatory intent. Um, that's some of what we see in the theories of the lawsuit challenging the Georgia laws, for example. So it's going to be an important, it's going to be important to keep an eye on that. There are some states that their election system is still so restrictive that even if looking at this totality of the circumstances, reformulated tests that came down recently, there still could be an argument made. Um, you know, we see a big contrast, for example, in this the two states where I work on voting rights, Illinois and Indiana, totally different election systems. So there are still arguments that, that can be made. But you know, my main point is voting rights litigation is usually not the key to success to protect voting rights. I don't meet too many clients or voters or community members who are really excited to go to court to try to have their right to vote protected. They'd much rather have something solved in the moment so that they can vote on that day itself. So different forms of grassroots mobilization, community education, and um, state legislative advocacy still remain the most important tools. Okay. Um, Josh, let me ask you a question. So uh, uh, David Melton, who's a, a stalwart of this event and of the uh, 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 organizations that are a part of it, asks, um, is there any meaning in the TransUnion case for um, federal laws that provide a statutory basis for damages uh, in disclosure statements, and, and he cites the Truth and Lending K, uh, the Truth and Lending uh, Act, as well as data security statutes. Um, is, is there a possibility here that that I, I guess grants by Congress of a statutory right to damages might be impacted by what the court did related to standing in TransUnion? Or, or are those, is that a different kettle of fish? I would say that there, there is an impact, um, uh, likely to be a strong impact from TransUnion on these cases. You know, it obviously depends on how the cases are pled. Uh, you know, there are, you know, you can envision scenarios where folks might have uh, injuries in fact that would clear the, the hurdles. Um, uh, that have been set down, but uh, I think that there are um, plenty of examples of cases where um, most, if not all, of the proposed class members in a uh, um, uh, case of the sort that you uh, mentioned uh, don't have any actual injury. They're just, uh, you know, it's a technical violation of some sort, and um, they're they're just after the statutory damages. Uh, and so I think in uh, certainly in cases like that, TransUnion is going to uh, have an effect. Okay, all right. Um, and, and Josh, a couple of people have asked in the chat, um, might it be significant that the Texas law that you mentioned, uh, giving people the right to bring a lawsuit would presumably be brought under Texas's state law standing doctrines, not federal standing doctrines. Do we know anything about whether Texas has more uh, uh, generous standing doctrines than the federal law uh, than federal law provides? Yeah, this is a very good question. I also saw there was a question, a similar question about Illinois. Uh, the, uh, and something I, you know, this is, this is what I get for, you know, throwing out an example at the end um, and uh, not really uh, getting into the details. Uh, it, yeah, so uh, states are not bound by Article 3 and they can establish their own standing principles. Uh, my understanding, though not uh, thoroughly researched uh, and you know could well be wrong, is that uh, Texas is among the states uh, that 
sort of generally follows uh, the federal court's Article Three jurisprudence. Um, and uh, you know, if they were to continue to do that uh, in the wake of TransUnion, then uh, you know you would expect them to apply TransUnion. Uh, you know, I, I'm afraid I can't say much more about that, not having you know dug deep into Texas standing law. No, um, but it, it, if nothing else, it, it does point up the importance of this concept of standing that we always have to keep in the back of our mind, in addition to whatever the merits of the case might be. Yeah. Um, Aziz, uh, maybe you could elaborate a little bit more on the sort of underlying uh, 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 philosophy behind laws that on the one hand protect religious liberty and on the other hand ban uh, discrimination. And so uh, there's a question in the chat, why does a Catholic organization's, the, the question says right of contract, but I think maybe it's really their right of religious liberty to not contract with somebody um, outweigh a couple's right to adopt. So someone poses the issue to you like that, how would you respond to what, if anything, Fulton does and, and, and how uh, uh, these two legal cons broader legal concepts, I guess, interact? Sure, and, and Steve, I can also answer the question about Cedar Point, if you'd like, which is in the, the chat. Mm -hmm. So I, I think that question is, is, is identifying two competing legal interests. So the first is the religious person or organization's interest in engaging in a certain activity. Many people thought that Fulton would go off on the point that the religious liberty, the, the religious organization of the Catholic charity is a contractor and, and no one has a right to contract with uh, a government. Uh, the court essentially ignores the contracting context and treats the uh, Catholic charity there as if it had an entitlement to uh, the contract regardless of its behavior. Uh, this is an echo of a, uh, of a case decided last year called Espinoza uh, in which the court uh, held that uh, establishment clause concerns doesn't give uh, the state a reason to exclude religious entities from a program that is otherwise discretionary. So, so that, that's on, the, on, on one side of the ledger. On the other side of the ledger is the, is the interest that the same-sex couple has uh, in having a, 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 a foster care provider work with them. Now, in Fulton itself, there was no evidence that a same-sex couple had been turned away either by CSS or another provider. And in my view, it is much more important to focus upon a harm that the court doesn't mention. A disproportionate number of children in the foster care system are LGBTQ, for, for obvious reasons, I think. And these children, whether they choose to or not, will henceforth be streamed through Catholic charities. And Catholic charities is, uh, to say the least, unlikely to account for the distinctive interests and the distinctive vulnerabilities of these children. So the Fulton case immediately imposes a harm on LGBTQ children coming through the foster care system. And this illustrates a broader point. Religious liberty advocates uh, in this new generation of uh, First Amendment claims have made it a point to argue that the fact that a religious liberty claim imposes a harm on a predictable third party is not a reason to reject that claim. It is not a state interest, that is, to prevent harms to LGBTQ children, families, or to female employees seeking contraception coverage. Right? That, I think, is a really important principle. Let me say a quick word about Cedar Point. Cedar Point is a case in which the court invalidated uh, a 1976 California statute uh, enacted as part of Cesar Chavez's campaign on behalf of farm workers that allowed union representatives to enter into uh, 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 agricultural land and talk to farm workers about unionization. Uh, that outcome, in my view, is a regrettable one, but what's more important is the principle that the court in Cedar Point articulated. Cedar Point held that any law that mandates third-party access to real property is uh, a per se violation of the Fifth Amendment's taking clause. Think about that principle. 
doesn't that principle apply directly to most kinds of housing discrimination? Housing discrimination law says that you or I, when we're renting uh, uh, an apartment or uh, a property, have to allow, let's say, somebody who's African American, somebody who's an LGBTQ person, uh, 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 onto that land. Under Cedar Point, much housing discrimination law is unconstitutional. So too is rent control law. And once one gets rid of housing discrimination, once one gets rid of rent control law as, as unconstitutional takings, why is employment discrimination? Why is discrimination in public accommodation uh, different? Cedar Point, I think, is a, a, a shoe that will at some point drop. And when it drops, will resonate loudly. Well, Aziz, thanks for giving us even more to worry about uh, with this court. Um, uh, Steve Schwinn, one of, the, uh, one of the questions we would have asked in a sort of general discussion anyway was asked in chat, and that is essentially, um, what did um, Amy Coney Barrett's appointment to the court, uh, 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 and she was there for pretty much the full term this year, what difference did that make? Uh, did she surprise you? Did she perform as expected? What do you make of, uh, of her first term as a justice? Yeah, thanks, Steve. What a fantastic question. So clearly she changes the ideological balance on the court from a 5-4 conservative progressive balance to a 6-3 balance, and she undoubtedly has aligned with the conservatives on the court. So there's no question about that. And this is an even more conservative court because of her replacement of Justice Ginsburg. But having said that, there has been some evidence that she is maybe tempering her views or being somewhat more cautious and going full throttle conservative and aligning herself with the chief in some cases and Kavanaugh in some cases. Uh, for example, in the case that Aziz talked about, the Fulton case, she did not go with the sharpest conservative wing of the, uh, of the court in, uh, in Fulton and instead said, you know what, I think I'd like to sit back and just kind of wait and see what is the best test that emerges for free exercise claims. So on the one hand, there's some evidence of that. On the other hand, she joined a very conservative court in the Brnovich case, the voting rights case in Cedar Point uh, and some other cases. So there's no question about it. This is a very politically conservative court, and more so with her addition. Okay. All right. We are at um, 159, and um, I, I hate to waste a minute that we would have, but, uh, but I don't think it's likely we're going to get in, into anything substantive in the one minute remaining. So let me just uh, issue a, a couple of reminders. The, uh, for those of you who need CLE, um, you, you've been waiting patiently. Uh, the information is there in the chat. Um, send your Illinois bar number, and I, I imagine your name too, and, and the, the name of this event um, to lcemails at acslaw.org. That is, uh, is in the chat if you need to take a look at that. So that's how you go about um, signing up for the CLE credit, the one hour of CLE credit for which this program has been approved. And, and earlier in the chat, if you scroll up, there's a link to the uh, ACS Chicago Lawyer Chapters Legal Legends Luncheon, which is coming up. Uh, and once again, Ami will be honored there with the ACS Chicago Chapter Ruth Goldberg Award. So congratulations to, to her. Uh, it's 1 p.m. Central Time. We've managed to pull this off, uh, come in just on time. Thank you. It was terrific to have more than 300 people in the audience. It was terrific to be with uh, 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 old and new friends and colleagues uh, as part of this panel. Um, so please continue to look for future ACLU of Illinois and ACS Chicago Lawyer Chapter events. Once more, thank you to the panelists. Thank you to everyone from the ACLU of Illinois and ACS Chicago who made this program possible. Thank you. We are, we are done.